Welcome back to Mossy Sales. Today we're talking about cyclores, which I think for me is the most controversial rule change for AC37. Cyclores jar with many traditional sailors. It just looks a little bit odd. And going back and thinking about why that is, why they look so odd, has helped me um, kind of unearth some of what I think are the fundamental issues that the teams will face with cyclos. It's also opened up what I think could be a critical area for development and exploitation to gain an advantage over other teams. Before we get into the deep dive on cyclos, let's uh, talk about the elephant in the room, clear up one thing. The cyclos aren't providing all the energy for the boat. I mean, well, fundamentally, first of all, the boat is powered by the wind. So that's the shear between water and the air. That's what's propelling the yachts around the course. Underneath the waterline, adjusting the foils, the flaps, the rake of the rudder, and even lifting and lowering the wings, that's all done by batteries. What's left is trimming the sails. That's, you know, conventional trimming of your main sheet, jib sheet, Cunningham, mass rotation, um, outhauls, all that kind of stuff. That is where the power from the cyclos or the, the grinders gets used. As the old saying goes, you can't change the wind, but you can adjust your sails. And in racing, being able to frequently and accurately adjust your sails is an advantage. So why has the reintroduction of cyclos been so controversial? Well, it's not really anything you ever see on a conventional boat. And that flags a very obvious question. If cyclos are so much better than hand grinders, why aren't they used on regular boats? The truth is, in most pits, the job is about moving from one task to the other, uh, doing that quickly and in coordination with the rest of the crew. You need to be mobile and space as well as a premium so you don't have actual real estate for a big cycle or setup. But for me, the biggest step change hasn't been what limbs people are using to carry out these tasks. It's been more about the hydraulic systems behind the scenes and their use of energy storage. Now, on the face of it, these systems are pretty simple, um, whereby grinders turn handles, which turns a hydraulic pump, which pumps oil into an accumulator. An accumulator is a, a chamber full of gas, and as you pump oil into it, the gas is uh, compressed, and that builds up pressure. And then when you release the valve, let that oil back out under pressure, it then fills up actuators which move the hydraulic rams and move the control surfaces um, so it's a relatively simple system but in there is the accumulator now accumulators can vary in size and a smaller accumulator with a, a gas spring can just even out you know like a suspension effectively even out some of the power sp spikes from the input but also vibrations coming in from the kind of like output end and reduce the loads in the system. But a larger accumulator, which allows a large amount of oil to be pumped in and stored under pressure, is actually a really efficient way of storing a decent amount of energy. And that smooths out the power demands. And for me, I think you're just kind of pumping oil to accumulate power. Then it doesn't really matter whether you're doing that with your hands or legs kind of detach yourself from what many would think is a traditional pit role. That for me is the disconnect. And it's not that I'm particularly against cyclos or grinders, I don't mind which. That said, I'm a very keen cyclist or have been. And in these rules, bearing in mind just what I explained about how the system works, I see some rather interesting challenges and uh, potential pitfalls for the teams in how they implement their cyclos. Delving into the rules, for AC75 there have been two significant changes on the kind of hydraulic and control systems. The first is that the pumps, the hydraulic pumps and the accumulators which store the power, they are all now effectively one design and you're not even allowed to change 
the gears whilst racing as you pump that fluid. That was an area which has been removed, which I thought was a, and many people thought was a big advantage of Ineos in the previous America's Cup. They were able to use fewer grinders, which freed, freed up Giles Scott for a floating tactician role. And that was particularly effective in the round robins when we were racing on the Auckland course in shifted conditions, less effective on the more open sea with steadier breezes where the tactics basically call themselves and it's more of a boat speed course. The second change is that the controls can now be linked and this shouldn't be understated. This time you're allowed to link um, actuators so you can have a transmission actuator that's like opening and closing the valve and that can be linked not only to passive input devices so buttons on displays but also linked to other controls about the boat whether that's mass rotation traveler position or even the loads on those systems so you know when the load hits two tons then that starts pulling on more cunningham etc etc linking the controls in that way opens up some really exciting opportunities and that really hasn't been spoke about that much but deserves a video in its own right okay let's talk about cyclores and where i see the space for innovation on this um, i think it's kind of taken as a given now that all teams will go to cyclores it's been heavily publicized on the kind of reintroduction of this it's been all in the america's cup media um, now the rules do say that you well they don't stipulate that you have to use hands or legs but they do say the power input has to be a rotary motion so you can't use a rowing machine for example and if you're going to use your arms your legs i think despite what i'm about to say about some of the difficulties of using your legs i do think that the legs with those larger muscle groups are superior let's discuss where the advantage still lies and where the kind of like details are that teams can manipulate for their favor i think the first thing to understand is what would be different between cycling and being a cyclor cycling is a sport which is dominated by momentum and it's momentum which effectively allows human physiology which has evolved for running to be used very efficiently on a rotation movement. For a grinding pedestal, human arms are actually um, designed to both push and pull, and the muscle groups are fairly well distributed across those two, um, two movements. For running, that is definitely not the case. Energy is imparted to the ground as you touch your foot down and push along, and that's mostly as you extend the leg. And when you think about it, that is probably another reason why grinding has been so popular, just because it meshes the push and pull. You can do it either way. You can grind one direction, then the other, with pretty much the same power output. Cycling, that is completely not the case. If you take up cycling, one thing you pretty quickly learn is that doing 300 watts uphill at 20 km hour feels very different from doing 300 watts on the flat at 50 kilometers an hour. And the reason behind that is all momentum. When you're going slower and got less momentum, you can feel the dead spots in those pedal strokes. Remember, human physiology is kind of built for running where you're pushing on the downstroke, but it's not really meant for pulling up. And it's this reason, this kind of variance in momentum, why cyclists train for both hills by doing hill repeats, practicing on steeper gradients at slower speeds. But cyclists actually practice for higher speeds as well on the flat being motor pace, same power, power output, same thresholds, but a different muscle recruitment and a different feel. And the physiology reacts in two different ways, those two similar but distinctly different tasks and if you've got a home trainer you'll know that they're fitted with a pretty heavy flywheel to build momentum and better simulate that kind of road feel and it's also why oval chain rings and osymmetric chain rings from time to time become kind of the, the fashion of the time as well oval chain rings work by varying the length of the lever um, through the rotation of the pedal strokes so it gives the rider a mechanical or a greater mechanical advantage in the dead spots 
and allows them to quickly move their foot through those parts of the pedal stroke and have a longer um, kind of power stroke through the the push down. I personally don't think there was ever any ever any great advantage to oval or asymmetric chain rings, and that's mostly because even when you're going uphill at 20 kilometers an hour, there's still a decent amount of momentum in the system to carry you through those dead spots. Add on to that, add on to that when you're going slow, there's less of an aerodynamic penalty, so you can afford to stand up and start engaging your arms, moving your body around, and kind of surging the bike through those dead spots. But one thing that will be very noticeable when these side claws get on their yachts is that when they're pumping oil, they have zero momentum. The boat, after trialling uh, 18 months ago with the hydraulic pump, it's not like a bike at all. You've got to, uh, you're pulling and pushing a dead weight and um, you need to train the right muscle to do the right movement. So it was a learning curve for me as well as the team. It'll effectively feel like they're on a home trainer with no flywheel at all. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of the riders struggle to put the outputs that they've managed in training on the road into the pedals on a yacht when they're pumping oil with zero momentum. So this is what I think is the first pretty big pitfall. So for any teams who have trained mostly on land, on a road, going reasonably quickly and getting faster and faster, I wouldn't be surprised if they really struggle to put out the same numbers that they can on the road when they get to pumping oil on the boats, simply because of this lack of momentum and not being accustomed to the feel of peddling oil around the system. So what are the possible solutions to this? Well, first of all, um, I'd be a bit of fearful of doing too much road riding in my training. I'd want to ideally rig up a oil pumping system. They know the oil pumps they're gonna use, they know the accumulators are gonna use. So it'd be pretty easy to set that up in a room and actually get a feel for the power output, what it feels like to actually push through those dead spots with no momentum and also optimize some of these other solutions to the dead spots. Just to clarify, you are not allowed a flywheel of any type on the boats to store energy. So doing what you do on a home trainer to solve this problem by putting a, a lump of steel or lead in the system and spinning that up, that they can't do, although that would have been a pretty neat solution. What they could do is link up two or more riders to the same drive shaft same pump and what that would do if you offset their um, cranks as they input power to that pump that would effectively mean your teammate is always peddling you through your dead spots now i've noticed that most tandems still have their cranks pretty much synchronized up i've read a bit about them slightly being offset but the majority of tandem even racing tandems have their cranks synchronized as well but I think some of that's more for the handling of the bike in terms of making sure you're moving in the same way at the same time for the steering, but also for when you're cornering and you want the outside pedal down for both, both riders so you don't get pedal strikes. But interesting idea, if you know anything about tandem cycling and crank offset, then let me know in the comments because I think it's something the team should certainly be looking at. But I actually think the better option, and this needs a bit of a rule clarification, but I think the best option, I've mentioned it already, is oval uh, osymmetric chain rings. Now I've already said I didn't think they were really that much an advantage on a road bike because fundamentally you still had a decent amount of momentum the whole time. But in this zero momentum system, I kind of think they could have some merit. Now, where it gets a bit vague is the rules say that the um, rotational velocity ratio at the cranks to the pump has to be fixed during racing. Now, an oval chain wing works by varying the rotational velocity of your pedal through the pedal strokes, speeding up through the dead spots and slower and steadier through the, the power stroke. However, 
depending on how you measure that rotational velocity, if you're measuring it at rotations per minute, then the overall chain rings or osymmetric chain rings will still effectively be the same RPM. It's just the actual angular speed will change through the pedal stroke. So that's it. That's what I'll be looking out for. It's a bit of a shame because I think there's some kind of really interesting technical questions there. But the way these cyclos are going to be covered up, we're probably not going to see the answers to much of that. So yeah, let me know. Did you prefer the days with a coordinated pit operation? Or do you actually think that the cyclos have kind of added a little bit of um, kind of athletic coolness um, mystique to the cup? Maybe some of the teams will be discussing this in their meetings on Monday morning. Right, that's it. Cheers. See you around.